Welcome to everybody. Uh, thanks for joining us. We'll get underway here. Um, my name is Stephen Hefner. I'm the managing director of uh, IEEE Publications. And uh, I'm very happy to be sharing this podium with Kent Anderson. And we're going to give you some, uh, a, a little bit of a, a, a different take, perhaps, than you use, usually hear about our industry. And those of you who don't know Kent, I highly recommend that you start to subscribe to his uh, newsletter, The Geyser. It's fantastic. Kent is a, you know, obviously a, a long history in the in the industry. Uh, now finds himself in the position of being thought leader, investigative journalist, and overall gadfly. It seems to me, uh, and uh, has a, a very interesting take on the complexities of our information space, both in the scholarly world and uh, and in the in the lay press as well. So. Um, uh, I think the way this will, will go is um, Kent's got a few things to say. I'll be chiming in with some publisher perspectives and asking a couple of questions. We hope to have a little conversation here at the end. And anybody who wants to chime in, uh, uh, do so. Um, we're, 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 uh, so without further ado, Kent, why don't you take it away for us? Great. Thanks, Stephen. <clears throat> Hi, everybody. How are you? Good. Nice. Any requests? <laughs> Freebird. <laughs> All right, I'm going to talk about the publisher's job, which I think has been denigrated, diminished, and, and taken apart in a way that's not helpful to society or to the advancement of science. And I think we need to reconsider it. And I'll give you a frame for, framework for reconsidering it and reasons to reconsider it. So the publisher's job, whether it's children's books, local news, science scholarship, what have you, is to serve a community, whether it's a music, music publisher, you can have jazz labels, you can have blues labels, and then providing independent leadership, finding things you might not be able to find, keeping things from you that are not trustworthy or not good quality. And that's the job, and that's a very important job in a society, a democracy even, so that people are operating from the same set of facts generally, and that they have trust in the community. And that trust, I think all of us who have been paying attention to the last 20 years have seen the levels of trust diminish because a very important link has been taken away. And this is an information revolution that I think has gone awry. And I think it's time for us to really acknowledge this. And Jonathan Rausch, in his book, the Constitution of Knowledge, A Defense of the Truth, which was published last year, writes, the techno-utopians, those are the people from Silicon Valley who thought that technology would simply take us to a new world of vast possibilities and unfettered information. The techno-utopians of the information revolution assumed that knowledge would spontaneously emerge from unmediated, a key term here, unmediated, interactions across a sprawling peer-to-peer -peer network with predictably disappointing results. Without the places where professionals like experts and editors and peer reviewers organize conversations, and I'm going to say a few of these phrases a few times to drive them home, compare propositions, assess competence, provide accountability, okay? Organize conversations, compare propositions, assess competence, provide accountability. Everywhere from scientific journals to Wikipedia pages, there is no marketplace of ideas. There are only cults warring and splintering and individuals running around making noise. Mediation is media. I can't get this phrase out of my mind once I heard it, which is that any media is defined by its mediation practices. And whether it's good or bad, the source of that is going to be always the root cause, the mediation practices. So if you look at what's going on with Elon Musk currently, the concern that everybody has about him taking that property over is that he is changing the mediation practices, okay? All of a sudden, the N-word is uh, flying about. All of a sudden, they're, you know, he's, permissioned himself to do a number of things because he's changing the media by changing the mediation. It's not because his ad sales approach or prices went up. It's because the mediation changed. 
Moderation or mediation defines media. Communities, which is what journals serve, which is what record labels serve, which is what anything that is a media source serves a community that has to, it has to define itself against a community it's serving for it to really be relevant. Communities need leaders, relevant information, and trust relationships. All right? Because if you don't trust one another, you don't have a community. Publishers emerged to serve communities. You look back through history, this is how they came about. They came about as a convenient way for people to say, here are the people who we trust to verify the news is true, to double check that somebody who's saying that is actually competent to say it, that they actually can prove what they're saying before it gets to the rest of us. Um, you know, this is a theory of gossip. If you had people who gossiped as some um, want us to publish, you wouldn't trust a lot of people who gossiped. One of the things that came out of the pandemic was an expert saying, this is the first pandemic where the scientific community actually confused the public. Okay, we actually confused the public because of our publishing practices and they were unmediated. The article economy doesn't address community needs. And this is a whole nother layer of what publishers deliver interpretation, expert summation, new perspectives that challenge current status quo thinking, policies, official guidance that make uniform things like the electrical outlets aren't going to spark on you, that your water is going to be clean, things like that. Your medicine is going to be pure. Funder pays is difficult to apply to many intellectual communities because it doesn't just doesn't work for those communities. And we, but we, we aren't willing to accept that because we have a model that's techno-utopian instead of community-based. So social sciences, doesn't really work. There aren't that many funders at work in that area. Engineering, not that many funders. Plus, they don't want things to be preliminary because you don't want to drive over a preliminary bridge. Medicine, very dangerous. We've all, you know, how many of you have taken ivermectin this week? Come on, you've heard it's great. Right? It's out there. All right. Media is mediation. So Twitter's all in the news. And there was a great article in The Verge last night or this morning. So I grabbed the quote. It's a fun article to read because the guy, I don't know if it's male or female, Millet is sassy, OK, whoever he or she is. It turns out that most people do not want to participate in horrible, unmoderated internet spaces. If you want more people to join Twitter and actually post tweets, you have to make the experience much, much more pleasant, which means moderating more aggressively because media is mediation. Anytime you start something in the media, you have to make mediation decisions. And to quote Neil Peart from Rush, if you don't make a choice, you still have made a choice. Okay? So the, anything to add yet? I've never seen you give a talk there. You didn't slip in a rush quote. No, that is true. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We need to hang out more. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I actually got it wrong, so I'll deal with that. But the thing, the one thing to realize is that publishers are not the only trusted intermediary that is under threat. There has been a 20 to 25 year uh, campaign to get rid of trusted intermediaries because various powerful people don't like them. They don't want to have to adhere to the truth or to rules or to boundaries. For instance, referees, umpires, and officials in sports. They are routinely threatened now. Young people who would typically have these as jobs for junior soccer leagues or whatever don't want to apply for them because the parents are so terrible. They don't you get a call that they like. They'll yell at you. They get death threats online, social media attacks. This is another trusted intermediary that's under assault. Judges are under assault. Like it or not, they shouldn't be, even if you don't like their politics, even if they are purely political animals. Shouldn't be, but they are routinely. And fewer and fewer people are going into that line of intermediation between, for justice, right? And we're supposed to have rule of law, but we seem to like rule of force. And then newspaper editors. And the way they've been attacked is economically, with various people taking away 
denigrating the subscription model, denigrating local news, making it so that they aren't able to cover local government shenanigans, keep people in line, scare people straight, make them worry about what others might find out. And the level of corruption that people are speculating is occurring in towns all over the United States especially, but in other places as well where this has fallen apart. People are really worried. And you wonder why so many kind of crackpots are rising through the ranks. It's because local politics is out of control, but nobody's there to even see it. So this is just part of a larger pattern that I want you to, I think you feel it, I think you see it, but you need to understand where this fits into this and this, or the world we occupy fits into it as well because denigrating these trusted intermediaries leads to problems. So anything there? No, I'm gonna, I, I got, uh, you got it. I'm gonna jump in in a second. Okay. Mm -hmm. So the traditional model of intermediation for scientific and scholarly claims was if there was a funder, and there wasn't always a funder, but there would be an author, and they would decide to do some research, let's say. And then when they got to the point, they would send it to an independent expert trusted intermediary who would assess how good is it along multiple metrics, right? Is it relevant to the audience, the community that I serve? Is it high quality? Are these people competent to make this claim? Have they made it in a way that's compelling and believable? Have they told us, divulged every possible interest that they might have in making this claim for a commercial end? And if it passes all those tests, it's relevant, it's high quality, it's interesting, they're competent, then it gets shared with the community. So the community can relax. The information they're getting is highly vetted, it's relevant, they can trust it. Then you get to the model that we seem to have drifted into, where you have funders and authors and research, and then everybody has to ask, how good is it? And a lot of people aren't ready, aren't competent to do that. Not because they're dumb, not because they're uneducated, just because it's a very particular set of skills, as Liam Neeson said. So you get a Neil Peart quote and a Liam Neeson quote. Yeah, I know, very good. It's, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, I'm pop culture fountain over here. <laughs> so how good is it? Well, the problem is, how do you even find it if it's not first vetted to be relevant to you? So you might not even know it exists. If you're a journalist in a clickbait driven world, what do you care about how good it is? You just want to get clicks. So you're going to elevate it even if it's crap, which believe me, I've, I've seen plenty of it. I've documented plenty of it. And I've been, I spent a half hour on the phone with a New York Times reporter to talk her out of something because she was basically so naive and so committed to getting the clicks that she thought she would get that I had to say, no, no, hold on, you're not, listen, you can, and then finally she said, really? And I said, yeah, really. She's like, okay, then I'm gonna have to drop this. I'm like, okay, it was a half hour well spent. And then social media, which the mediation practices there are terrible because they drive outrage. They drive extremists, they drive extremist views. And then, guess who has to clean up? But they're no longer an intermediary, right? It's too late. Cat's out of the bag. Yeah, this is, this is exactly where I wanted to chime in, because I, I understand the fears that, that, uh, that Kent's talking about around um, un, uh, misinformation or untrustworthy or unauthoritative information finding its way into a sphere in high circulation. But there are other effects to the disintermediation of the publishers in these spaces. And they are more corrosive, I would say, to the overall culture of the science that's being done. And I'm speaking specifically about science here, although your, yours certainly is, um, you know, has political and social ramifications as well. I think of the, for example, we're a, we're a publisher uh, that's also a, a professional society, a professional and learned society. We uh, represent a community of scholars that are uniquely able to provide some normative direction towards how science is conducted, how this publishing cycle works, uh, what uh, guarding against things like bibliographic uh, manipulation, guarding against uh, fake imagery, plagiarism, and the like, not just because we can detect it as the intermediary, but because we are a society and a fraternal organization, pardon the word, word fraternal, I can't quite get a, a, a gender Social. neutral uh, uh, word for that, uh, uh, that, that has peer-to-peer -peer consequences for misbehavior. 
so, so we, we, we can create a, a certain um, dynamic that uh, punishes with real consequences uh, actors who are acting outside the norm in the scientific space. So in some ways we are a guardian of, uh, of the scientific method there. When we're disintermediated by that, from that, either by process because of uh, they're cutting us out of peer review or, or by finance, because it's no longer sustainable for us to endeavor to to participate in this endeavor, that is a serious problem for the entire um, uh, enterprise of science uh, at the, at this point. The other thing I'll say that's uh, unique about the danger of disintermediation in 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 this world is um, is as a community of scholars we are able to make investments in time and expertise in developing the new fields of interest, the next thing, the next inter uh, intersection of one discipline and another. Uh, we're currently in an environment where uh, if it's not going to hit right away, or if I can't put together a special issue that can suck all the oxygen and APCs out of a particular community right now, then I'm not going to pay attention to it. Rather than the long, arduous process of building a community and uh, investing in a time uh, over, the, over the course of years to put together a journal that, that's uh, going to be meaningful for the next uh, advancement. So those are just two I'd, I'd, I'd add to it. It's a little, you know, maybe it's a little inside baseball, but we're all inside baseball. Yeah, no, I think, you know, one of the things you said, Stephen, and we will have a conversation. I'm going to try to speed through this, um, but without hurrying. One of the things you said, so MDPI is one of the organizations that, so this is how community can be actually kneecapped by the type of publishing that we're seeing more of, is let's say there is a nascent community and they have some interesting papers coming about and a publisher like Omics or MDPI or somebody like that comes in and says, we're going to special issue this, here, pay us all the APCs, we'll put in a special issue, and then that's it. They don't back it up, they don't follow through, they don't build a community, they just exploit it, steal of it, its nascent intellectual assets, piss people off, make them disillusioned, seriously. Because it's like, wait, I published and you now it, I, I didn't get much for that and I paid you. And what happens then? Did we just miss the important thing that would have unlocked fusion? Did we just miss the thing that would have unlocked the microbiome? Did we just, what did we miss? We don't know because it's exploitation, it's not cultivation. So what it comes down to is in a very important concept of what we privilege in a system. That is what gets primacy, what comes first, what comes second, what do we pay attention to? And I would say just roughly, it was hard, I had a really hard time what to call this column, but let's say pre-2000, right, before OA and all this stuff really got ahead of steam. So editors, we privilege them. Publishers, we privilege them. Reviewers, we privileged them. Readers were the focus. That's why we did all these things. The scholarly record, we wanted to keep it clean, to keep it uh, clear. Truth and quality, soundness, relevance, however you want to define it. Aspirational, maybe amorphous, but still, a lot of aspirations are amorphous. Doesn't mean they're wrong. And the trusted intermediary was there. The editors, the publishers, and the reviewers. And the reviewers are a broad swath. It can depend on the field. Sometimes it's scholars, sometimes it's statisticians, sometimes it's technical reviewers, sometimes it's others. Just depends on the field, whether it's practitioner heavy, whether it's researcher heavy, whether it's, you know, you need somebody to run the code, or whether you just need somebody who understands the, the physiology. In the current era, what we privilege, authors, Funders, price, open, whatever that means, and definitions vary. What I call scrapbooking, which is we're like every scientist's grandma now. It's like, oh, look what Jimmy did in phase one. Let's put that up on the fridge. <laughs> look what little Janie did on phase two. Let's put that on the fridge. Nobody cares. <laughs> Equity which I'm reading an interesting book by Jonathan Haidt about the, um, the righteous mind. And he talks about how, whatever you call it, multiculturalism, equity, equality, equity, whatever, this, this desire to erase possible truths about us as humans has permeated 
science and it gets in the way of truth because maybe the truth is there are fundamental differences. What if there are? Are we going to hide from that? And then quantity, speed and scale. And you look at the quotes of just this week, I was reading something where it was from Clark and Esposito. And they're like, you know, now Springer Nature's up to this many articles and this many articles and this many, you know, this, it's like, really? It's like the Bruce Springsteen song. Nice. 55 channels and nothing on. <laughs> Thank you very much. So, some other things that, as a result of some of what we privilege currently, you want to talk to me? Yeah, I mean, I was going to talk just a little let me bit know about when ch chasing news. Yeah, right, exactly. There's a whole list here. You can just click through them if you yep. want. I mean, some, um, this morning at a, at a session we were, we were doing on uh, evaluating um, what, what data do you need to evaluate a, a good uh, transformative agreement. One of the ones, of course, the key one is still usage. And uh, so usage of either paywalled or, or open access articles that, uh, that are part of your deal with that publisher. And, uh, and, and it gets down to some of the, the things that we've seen, uh, the shenanigans that, that publishers are tempted to play with usage. Uh, you know, Counter has chased it over the years, but releasing the next version all the time to try and catch some of the, some of the gaming of it. But, um, but there's other subtle gaming that's going on now, even in our scholarly environment, uh, that we've already seen in the lay press as well. So, so recommendation engines that drive clicks uh, to promote usage, which have the ultimate um, effect of, of, of pushing scholars into silos of their own belief, right? Uh, and are we really servicing anybody by chasing this metric is not just a, uh, it's a useless thing, but it's a dangerous thing uh, over time. Uh, we talked already a little bit about the chasing of APCs. I think that that's, uh, that, that idea of just uh, exploiting uh, uh, scholarly communities for whatever you can assemble in terms of papers in the coming year is not appropriate either. Uh, popularity over authority, you know, I, I got nothing against altmetric, but, uh, you know, uh, sometimes the, the, the self-promotion of scholars uh, that, that circumvent some of the discovery uh, and legitimate discovery uh, services is, is a problem. I mean, the, the most popular science and the most tweeted science is not necessarily the best science. So um, I think that covers all of them. They're okay. Yeah. All right. So now I'm going to see if how many people remember something this might this actually could have been a bruce springsteen yeah. reference too so how many of you remember the last big pandemic that took millions of lives decimated continents changed social mores how many remember that it happened in most of your lifetimes from what i can tell no yeah HIV, finally, yep. So it was interesting going back to 1991, an article in 1991, which is why Arnold is here. That wasn't, that sucked. No. That was terrible. <laughs> I am sorry, Arnold. All right, too high a voice, wrong accent. All right, so in 1985, during the height of the HIV AIDS pandemic, three physicians in Paris held a press conference to announce that cyclosporine was effective in the treatment of AIDS. Their announcement was reported widely in the American press, and the Wall Street Journal scolded the American research community for not informing the public of the results quickly enough. However, the evidence for the French claim was never published and proved to have no basis in fact. In 1987, ICN Pharmaceuticals, manufacturers of the antiviral ribavirin, called a press conference to announce that the drug slowed the progression of HIV infections. Data were said to be forthcoming. The stock rocketed upwards. Later, the FDA found the claims to have no validity. Elizabeth Holmes, remember that name? The modern thing. Jake Andraka, remember them? Those are two people who were stopped by the fact that they could not produce a peer-reviewed paper. Okay? The intermediary in place stops bullshit. So, Writing in NEJM in 1991, the same year Terminator 2 was released, with someone with a better Arnold Schwarzenegger act, Swigger accent, the editors addressed pressures to speed the release of information about AIDS and HIV research. 
<clears throat> as we see it, the risk is that consumers will be receiving misinformation as well as valid information, and that they and their doctors will find it difficult to tell which is which. Misinformation is not innocuous. Much is made of the value of early news of research. Too little is made of the risks. It is not clear whether the announcements about cyclosporine and ribavirin shorten lives, but they raised false hopes and contribute to indiscriminate cynicism about the validity of medical research. So the false hopes bit, pretty obvious, but the indiscriminate cynicism about the validity of medical research, that is the more profound problem because that speaks to trust in a really deep and corrosive way. When you start really corroding people's trust in the system, you might get vaccination rates that are around 60% when you have a miraculous mRNA vaccine that could wipe COVID out if you got it up to 92%. You might have indiscriminate cynicism lead to people taking horse pills because they don't trust the medical establishment. You might have a medical establishment, a scientific publishing establishment that confuses the public during a pandemic instead of supporting them and the community that they live in. This is why sometimes I get so frustrated with this. This is so obvious. The Aspen Digital Commission on Information Disorder about a year ago referred to this as information disorder. We would expect information disorder to be a central concern for anyone in society who bears the title of leader. This should be the center of anything you talk about. How do you fix this? And yet all things should be on the table because it is critical. Proactive leadership rising from within every sector and institution in our society. Not just a few, every sector and institution in our society is our only way out of this crisis. And yet it is sorely missing. The committed and powerful leadership we need is not yet the leadership we have. And finally, the last quote I'll share with you from David Brooks, writing about why the, we're having these problems. Our class, sort of the people who in this room, has not delivered for the people outside it. On our watch, government and the other public institutions have deteriorated. Part of the problem is that steeped in an outsider, pseudo-rebel ethos, we never accepted the fact that we were a leadership class, never took the institutional responsibilities that go with that acceptance, never got to know or work with people not in our class, and never earned the legitimacy and trust that is required if any group is going to effectively lead. And one of the things that the pandemic allowed me to do was to socialize with people who are out of this not in this class, a great deal. And I can tell you that when it comes to practical matters, we are very impractical. They are very practical. And what I'm trying to return us to as trusted intermediaries is a level of pragmatism about what it means to have that institutional responsibility. And that if you shirk it, the dangers are not only, they're every, it, it, they're huge. And it's part of a broader problem in society where all trusted intermediaries are under attack. Referees, judges, publishers, editors, anybody who's trying to mediate. But mediation is media. So anything you're doing in media is about mediation. So it's time to start remediation. And love to have your questions. I think, Stephen, you wanted to kick well, off. Well, no, I, I just think it's an important challenge. I thought that I've uh, agreed with anything David Brooks has said recently, but uh, um, but, but I'll give him this one. And, and, um, and it does seem to me that we are leaders in this industry, and I've been in a leadership position in an STM publisher for about 10 years now at uh, IEEE and before that at a commercial publisher, Walters Kluwer, and uh, take seriously the fact that we have to maintain this position as mediator, do the right thing for science, continue to be the guardians of that scientific method and the scientific record, um, uh, and partner with librarians and other uh, members of the of the academe, and and actually in industry as well, to to make sure that 
we sidestep the obstacles that some of these business models are creating or the disincentives to doing the right thing that the business models create. And I hope that we can solve those things together. So I was just going to kick this off uh, the discussion, if I could ask Kent uh, a question be before we, we, we grab some other ones. And, and that is, um, you know, where, where was the miscalculation that led, led to this? I mean, certainly we know from the past that this idea of a public discourse is that as a cacophony of noise rather than a well-ordered mediated debate has been around for a long time. The golden age of yellow journalism and, 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 and newspapers that could publish anything they want on the streets of New York. Uh, what is different now from that uh, disordered chaos of the past? Right, that's a great question. So. It, all of these things occurred in the past, conspiracy theories, yellow journalism, misinformation, but they didn't have the speed and scale that things do now. So speed and scale have really um, in, have increased you know, in ways that people didn't anticipate the consequences of that. At the same time, you also had culturally, instead of just dis like disruption technically, the kind that Clayton Christensen wrote about and all of that is about disrupting how something is made, but not disrupting what is made. So if you wanted to get rebar made in steel mini mills and rather than in you know, full on steel mills, that was disrupting the supply chain, but you still got the same rebar. If you wanted to have you know, little motorcycles and you wanted to have them made in a different way coming out of Japan rather than how they were being made in the US or in England, that was disrupting that, but you still got the same motorcycle, right? What we've done is we've disrupted the product. We've disrupted what people valued. And we've disrupted the norms around that. I think kind of in, in I think there was also this sort of obeisance to Silicon Valley thinking, which they are not liberals people, they're libertarians. And they're libertarians who build bunkers to keep you out in case things go really wrong. <laughs> so they are not your friend, they are exploiting, and they are taking your money, and they, you know, I think emulating them, I mean, how many times did we say that this has to be the iTunes of this, or this is going to be the Facebook of that, or this is going to be, well, guess what, it all comes down to mediation, and they are terrible mediators, and they mediate for a very particular purpose, and I think that other, you know, so it, there's been, it's been this whole sort of um, progression once the internet gained ban enough bandwidth to get speed and scale that was dangerous, then it created opportunities for people to feast on that and to feast on some of our worst traits, our dopamine cycle and other things. And now it's time to sort of bring it back around. And it's been interesting since, you know, certain events in 2015, 2016, all of a sudden, people are talking about how Facebook is mediated, how Twitter's mediated, because it is occurring to people that you need better mediation. So I think we might be hopefully rounding a corner here, but boy, it's taken us a long time and caused a lot of damage. Yeah, great. We had a question here. No, I'll, I'm just breaking it. Oh, oh, no, no, I you were. oh okay. Sorry. Any questions? Um, some of the ways you talk about technology are very much uh, in opposition to the techno babble that comes out of Silicon Valley. But if you if you take away that stuff and just look at the the implications of the technology without the spin, just the quantity of data. How do you place trusted mediators in front of the data sets that we're producing now, which are just on a staggering scale? I mean, and, that, and that's irrespective of the spin of somebody like Elon Musk, just the, the response to what the technology enables makes the intermediary role completely unscalable. Well, I don't know that that's necessarily true. I mean, all, <clears throat> every distribution and concatenation advance has always kind of left people on their heels a little bit. But I think if we threw the amount of engineering expertise and money that's behind the advertising systems of Google and Facebook at generating machine learning techniques that could at least give you first pass validity validation of large scale data sets. Um, could at least you know, give a human uh, reviewer, here are some things you might flag a few things for them to say, you know, this, this 
doesn't look, you know, we ran these variable tests, uh, statistical tests, and all these other things on the data. Looks okay, but you might want to look at these few things. So I think there are definitely ways to have human-machine um, partnerships around large-scale data sets, fast-moving information flows. But again, I also think you need to deprecate speed and scale to quality um, and other things like that. So, so I think that's another part of this. You can have those large, I mean, you look at, look at what NASA does with the Webb telescope, right? So they spend a good deal of time parsing the data that's coming off of that. Almost any system um, that they get, they, they parse it before they release it publicly. Um, I remember in 1999, in, so Yellowstone, my company is Caldera, and it's named after the Yellowstone Caldera, so that's the Old Faithful on there. And they have seismographs all over surrounding that because there's concern that that might actually blow again, right? So they're always monitoring. One of them went haywire one time. And they had real-time data, and so the conspiracy theorists got hold of that, and they're like, oh my God, the Caldera's gonna blow, and the government's, you know, it's government's keeping it secret, and da, da 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 So what the University of Utah and others did is they introduced time lag. So that before the data went live, they had a few hours to make sure it was right, and if it wasn't right, to understand why it wasn't right. Television, eight-second rule, if somebody swears during a live performance, you know, you, so you can introduce all sorts of little tricks to make sure the mediation is what you want. But I think to your specific example, I think that if you reoriented toward um, solving that problem, rather than tolerating it or thinking it's not a problem, you could, because there's tons of brilliant computer scientists out there. Yeah, and you I, know I, would, that. I would just say that, that, that this is not a new problem, right? Maybe the scale has changed a little bit, but, uh, but the quantity of data, it makes it unusable. And that has been the case, uh, you know, in why they invented A&I databases in the first place, right? Uh, so, so there has always got to be some curation function. And I would love to expand the, the definition of accessible to be something more than just free, but also usable, applicable, understandable, digestible. Uh, and that's the, the mediator role that I think, in addition to quality and vetting, that, that publishers have traditionally and should continue to play. Mm -hmm. Anybody? We got one over here. You, you, you mentioned that this is not a new problem, and I should begin by admitting I started my life as a medieval historian, so I go back a long way. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm very much with you on all of this, but you're using words like guardian, preservation, uh, trusted intermediaries. What would you have done with Galileo's first paper? What would you have done with William Harvey's first paper, where radical thinking comes in? Right. That's something which completely demolishes all the existing guardians, professional standards, and all of those sorts of things. How do you deal with, I mean, I, I approve of the guardianship and all of that, but I just have this little niggling bit that does it actually destroy original thinking as well? Well, I'll, I'll take that if Go you ahead. want. So Galileo lived in a time where sponsors were a big deal, right? Medici family and all of that. My concern is we're actually moving back toward a form of feudalism with the kind of funding model that we're moving toward where you have a few families, say, that are bestowing funding and deciding what gets published. My experience, and you know, this is one of the, the canards of the open access movement in my view, and I've been in publishing a long time, and I've come from an editorial background, so I've seen it, is that there's no you know, negative study, no, negative studies aren't published. They're published all the time. It's just they're interesting n negative studies. And, but I've, I've, you know, there were years at New England Journal of Medicine where the, pre, you know, the reprint revenue, which was, used to exist, was severely hampered because there were negative trials all over the place. That's what the editors, they were interesting ones. Um, the, the scientist who broke the H. pylori ulcer connection was a single scientist in Australia who decided to drink H. pylori, God love him, uh, Australia or New Zealand, one of the, I forget, and I'm thinking New Zealand now, but that he proved, you know, using Koch's postulate, that it was H. pylori. It wasn't stress-causing ulcers, it was an infection. That paper got into a top journal, like that, all over the place, you know, he didn't have any funding. 
So, you know, this whole idea that you need funders, I think we're actually, my concern is we're returning to a time where Galileo would be potentially sidelined by interests that are both rich and positioned well enough over publishing to make that a problem. That's my concern. Yeah, and I, and I, would, I would just point out that the, it's the process we're the guardians of, right, um, and, and the result thereof. Because one could argue that every paper is actually wrong because the next one's going to build on it and, and show something else. You know, we should be retracting all of Newton's papers because they clearly what do not quite have it right. right. Um, uh, but so, you know, it's, the, it's ensuring that a disinterested and agnostic peer review process happens and that we can hold accountable the, the scholars that are participating in that process from the research to the writing to the peer review to the editing. And, and, and forward. After that, you know, I'm not saying we wash our hands of it, but that is the extent of our interest. And if we had more interest than that, I'd think we would be dangerous. Mm -hmm. Pretty deep waters, huh? <laughs> yep. One more. So one of the things you mentioned about mediation was that it requires time, like the a lag for your TV signal or an interruption in the data. So how do you reintroduce that as an expectation that there will be a lag? Right. So France, So technologically, you can do it right now. Well, so technologically, for, you can do it, but how do you introduce that as an expectation that there will be a lag? Because I think you right. would expect mm -hmm. there to be no lag. Mm -hmm. Right. So Apple has just done it with their latest iOS upgrade. So you can unsend an email for, I think, five minutes, right? So you have a, a lag to go, oop, shit. You know, wasn't I meant, didn't, I probably shouldn't sure say that, that to my boss or, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. that's the wrong Neil Peart quote or whatever. Um, the same with text messaging. But Frances Haugen, uh, the whistleblower of the Facebook papers, the most recent one, her proposition was that you would have a 15-minute uh, tweet delay, right? So you tweet something, 15 minutes, and it will publish. You also can have scheduling features. Um, you can schedule something. I just scheduled something on Facebook to go live to promote something I'm interested in. Um, and, but you, you know, again, we even just conversing about speed and scale as things that are potentially dangerous is important because one of the things I've noticed people doing more and more is having private text groups, right? Mini social media hubs of their own devising. And for very particular purposes, you know, we're gonna, we've got a dinner group, or we've got the book club, or we've got the whatever, you know. And social media should be not as performative as it is. It should be truly social. It works then great. But, you, you know, do you really need, maybe you should cap, there are other, I mean, you get your imagination going if speed and scale are no longer what you're after. You can have 15 friends, you know. You need to pay after that, because you're obviously, a show pony, you know, so, you know, because nobody has, you know, at this age, nobody has more than 15 friends. So anyhow, um, but you, you can see how there would be ways to make it so that it would not be as um, profligate and out of control and speed and scale devoted as it is. Just have to put our imaginations to it and uh, don't accept those things as natural uh, inevitabilities. No, I don't. I, I, if I, I, I have never agreed with any argument about have we already lost it because that is that is to me. It's like when you know when Trump won the election, for instance. There are people ring, you know, wringing their hands. You know, have we lost democracy? No, I will fight to my lip, till my dying breath that we have not lost democracy. I will fight till my dying breath that we have not lost the ability to separate truth from fiction and to keep miscreants away from poisoning our children's minds with misinformation. I just, we can't lose it. It's too existentially important. Well, with that uh, grandiose oath, perhaps we should uh, 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 say that uh, we've had a really nice t time chatting here and we'd be happy to keep talking about it, but I think we're at time. So we'll, yeah. we'll call it a day. Thank, Thank you, everybody. Thank you.